We have a lot of great content to cover today. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, again, as you continue to enter, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share your favorite winter beverage. Um, I know for me, it's always the, the hot buttered rum, which is really all about the brown sugar in, in that. Um, and if we will have all the slides, the recording and the summary available on our website, um, we are in the midst of rebuilding some of the back end uh, on our website. So it's a little funky. So if you have trouble finding anything in the meantime, um, please feel free to email me, Marielle, uh, it, with any questions. But we should have the recording and the slides up uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, and as we're going through, please feel free to add your questions to the chat and then raise your hand when we get to the discussion period to, and we'll unmute and call on you there. So as we are diving in, as always want to acknowledge that I am personally joining from the traditional lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Stillaguamish, um, but encourage everybody to be aware of that since as we're talking about water quality, really it has an impact across many of um, the tribes in our region and builds on their stewardship since time immemorial. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tessa to just kind of set the stage for today's conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Marielle. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for being here. It's so nice to see uh, so many people joining us. Um, and I want to acknowledge Marielle, who has definitely done uh, the lion's share of the work in pulling this together. So thanks so much, Marielle. Um, so this, this workshop is a, is a co-production um, between uh, the PSEMP Modeling Work Group and the Puget Sound Institute. Um, I'm here representing the PSEMP, the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Programs Modeling Work Group. I'm the chair of that work group and Genoa Soloway is also here. She's our coordinator. Um, and the aims of the modeling work group are to really improve the use of models in Puget Sound recovery um, through in improving dialogue between modelers and model users. Um, and one of our primary activities is um, um, holding a series of workshops focused on um, model themes, modeling themes we pull together modelers who are working on the same theme, hopefully with model users to get a little bit into some of the technicalities, but also to think about how these models can be best put to uh, best put to use. So trying to improve that dialogue. Um, and um, if you're interested in hearing more about the um, PSIMP modeling work group or in joining our work group, I encourage you to uh, become a member. <laughs> this is it, actually, you guys, it's a membership drive. Sorry to, uh, sorry to have um, lured you here, but we're really going to be asking for your donations pretty soon. Um, no, send uh, Genoa an email. Um, I'm also going to drop into the chat a link to our um, work group page so that you can check out some more about that. Um, and Marielle, can you go to the next slide? I'm also going to plug, take the opportunity here to plug. Um, one of the products of our work group that we're presently putting together, um, which we're calling the Modeling Compendium. This is essentially um, a, a document that's gonna um, aggregate sort of a description of the modeling capacity that we have in, Puget, in the Puget Sound region. Um, the goal there is to really, um, again, increase the dialogue between modelers and model users, um, try to um, assist in, in activities that link our modeling capacity to their use and support of Puget Sound recovery and restoration planning. Um, so I know we have uh, a lot of modelers on the call here today, many of whom are, have already um, submitted their contributions to this compendium. But if you have not yet and you're interested, um, please uh, follow the link that I just dropped in the chat. Um, It'll take you to a handy dandy little Google uh, Google form um, asking you just a few basic questions about your modeling activities. Um, and we'll be using that to develop this, uh, this compendium that we'll share broadly. 
Um, and so that's the that's the context for for the PSEMP end. And I'll hand it over to Marielle to talk a bit about the Puget Sound Institute work. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I see many familiar faces this morning, um, but for those who maybe are new to this workshop series, um, this really comes out of the work PSI has been doing with the Puget Sound Partnerships Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy and some of the scientific uncertainties that were prioritized by many of you and experts in the region related to both the science of nutrients, but also the science of modeling. And as there is kind of more conversations around watershed models and decision support tools and some exciting momentum in the region. Um, this is intended to be a, a starter to a conversation. Um, it's by no means comprehensive. And so to, to Tessa's point too about the compendium, um, as we go through, not only please ask questions about the specific tools and models you're seeing, but if there are other ones that you think are important to have as part of the conversations moving forward and familiarity in the region, um, add those in. We'll not not only add them to the compendium, but also the summary for this workshop series. And with that, I'm going to hand things over as we're kind of starting off with this just very rapid fire overview of some of the watershed models and tools um, to Scott Brewer. Scott. Thank you, Marielle. Um, yeah, I'm Scott Brewer. I'm executive director with the Canal Coordinating Council, and I I don't have a, a PowerPoint other than what you've got up on the screen that Mariel put together uh, for me here. Uh, the Lick Canal Corning Council, just for some of you that may not know, it's uh, composed the members of three counties, Mason, Kitsap, and Jefferson, and two tribes, the Port Gamble, Sklalem, and the Skokomish tribe. These are the, the entities, if you will, that have the uh, land use um, authority uh, around the Hood Canal watershed and including up into the Eastern Strait of uh, Juan de Fuca there. So we developed what's called a, a Hood Canal landscape assessment and prioritization tool. This is not a model yet. Um, and it might be a decision support tool, but it may be not in the classic sense because you still aren't at the point or we aren't at that point of pushing that button, if you will, to, to, you know, here's your decision to be made. However, we think it's been a great tool to help facilitate having that kind of discussion and, and tools that way. Um, and I'll just say in advance, if you, you can go to, to the uh, uh, web link there that, that Mario has up and you can take a look at a very, I'll call it a very cursory uh, 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 view, if you will, of the, of the tool. This is still in development. We're in phase two right now. We started out with this when we, um, well, we, we feel we're pretty fortunate at Canal. There's still a lot of areas, areas, habitats, uh, that are working, that are in functioning and in good shape, and how can we maintain that and keep protecting those? So we started out, this originally was like, a, a, we call it a protected lands uh, tool, really just a GIS mapping uh, approach to see where, where we had and tried to figure out what is the degree of protection. And in and, Hood and Canal, it's anywhere from, you know, national parks that are pretty much, you know, no touch, no development, uh, moving through into uh, forest service areas, which, you know, has a little bit more development, but into uh, uh, more than towns. And, and we only have one incorporated area that's Port Townsend up in the north end of, of Hood Canal, uh, but no other incorporated areas there, just uh, various enclaves and, and, if you will, towns, villages uh, of, of people. And, and development that go on there. The Hood Canal is very dependent on natural resources for its economy, recreation and, and uh, shellfish and forestry, fishing, all the above there. So we, we thought, what can we do then to, to do this, to figure out you know, what are gaps, what's affecting this of projects, identify opportunities to align, improve consistency, across our five jurisdictions uh, to improve that protection and stewardship of, of these natural resources. There's been a, a variety of planning and environmental inf information has been analyzed and, uh, and identified to um, uh, help us out. And, and the whole idea is that we want to uh, take a look at, you know, the functions that are going, ecological function on there, what are the local pressures uh, what are the counties looking at and the tribes looking at in terms of the types of development and what they want to protect? So we're hoping this tool can be used to help facilitate and inform 
you know, those kinds of solutions about what do we do? What do we do on the ground there? So we're thinking that this lab tool, like, like I mentioned, we can use this to inform our partners, uh, start thinking about discussing strategic priorities, uh, developing projects to address the various actions that we believe are being needed and just help determine what those priorities ought to be. We have in our mind that we would like to create um, a, a way to achieve the prioritization. Uh, we're looking at various, if you will, formulas, um, a way to make it a model uh, so that we can take a look at, you know, what, if, well, I'd like to be able to just press that button and here's, here's what the priority is. But I think that, of course, requires a lot of input from various people throughout the canal, which we have been getting. Uh, to determine what is it you want to look at? Is your priority salmon recovery? Or is it, you know, making sure there's bowling alleys and, and, and parking lots or something in between there? So hopefully this tool can help us make that kind of informed decision there. You know, what are you going to give up if you have that bowling alley? Or what are you going to give up uh, for, for human development if you are trying to protect and, and maintain certain kinds of uh, habitat there? So we've included in here our data layers of zoning, land use, uh, regulatory programs. Uh, and, and like I mentioned, we're gonna you know, use that to, I like to look at it as an overlay. I can imagine uh, one, one of the things we're, we're responsible for in Hood Canal is we're the regional recovery organization for summer chum salmon, which is listed as threatened under Endangered Species Act. Can we take a look at what are the habitats that are truly needed to continue to function and perpetuate in the future and overlay that with how's the land being proposed to be used? How is it being used? And is there a way then to have that discussion about what are the best management practices? What kind of you know, conservation approaches, protection, restoration that can take place there? So we've got uh, some of the databases that, that we have involved in this. We've, uh, we've done a, uh, what's called an ecosystem diagnosis and treatment EDT model for summer chum, a little bit also for uh, Chinook salmon in the canal. Uh, we've used Department of Ecology's watershed characterizations assessments. We have limiting factors reports. And we've got the, uh, the Coastal Geologic Service beach strategies for near shore restoration. And this is just, a very small sample of the many uh, databases that we've been able to capture and put into this. Uh, we've looked at every single county's, every land parcel and every, um, you know, which way they've been able to take a look at how, how you might consider protection in there or what other kinds of uh, use that way and have that current, yeah, land management. Um, we're looking at projected uh, population growth and then changes in land, land cover over time. Um, and like I said, we can layer that with some of the other things of what we're trying to protect and make those kinds of decisions. We're also hoping to be incorporating uh, some uh, human dimensions, human well being factors, and other things like that. But like I say, we're still uh, in progress, a work in progress, and to be determined. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll apologize now. I, yes, I've been involved in this project, but not intimately and directly. Um, Haley Hargath of our staff was, is, was the main point person, but back in November, uh, she uh, gave birth to her second child. And so she's taking some time off right now to uh, care for that, that little one right now. So I got, I got this job at the moment here, but that's all right. So thanks, Marielle. That's, that's what I've got for the moment there. Thank um, you, Scott. I appreciate you pitch hitting and jumping in to share some of that context. Um, fun to see. And I know there's lots more on the website and um, one of the many great tools to have in the region. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing, Marielle, you, you reminded me to remind myself. I will be given a webinar for this because this is funded under a, a NEP grant that we have through the uh, Habitat Cell on January 9th of 2023. I believe it's uh, scheduled to start at 11 a.m. Uh, but look, look for that announcement. You'll, you'll get a lot more detail about where we're at at that time um, with this lab tool. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Bob to share an update on Velma.
Bob, you may be muted. I think you should have magic powers back again to be able to unmute. Yeah, thanks, Marielle. Wonderful. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. And I'd like to say initially, uh, thanks to my Belma teammates at our EPA lab in Corvallis, Oregon. Some of them are on the line here. Um, all have played a major role in developing Belma for the kinds of applications I'll describe this morning. Next. So for a little background on VELMA, uh, which is the acronym, by the way, for Visualizing Ecosystem Land Management Assessments, uh, VELMA is a spatially distributed or grid-based watershed model that simulates the interaction of hydrological plant and soil processes that control the capacity of watersheds to provide a range of ecosystem goods and services listed here in part. Uh, we, be we began developing VELMA in 2006 uh, various improvements and publications have since demonstrated the model's capabilities for modeling transfers of water, nutrients, and contaminants within watersheds. Scales model, uh, modeled include small plots to hill slopes to large river basins and from days to centuries, uh, all do doing that uh, dynamically, by the way. Velma is applicable to essentially any landscape, including watersheds encompassing mixtures of urban and rural cover types and land uses. Drivers of change include climate, land use, land cover, additions of nutrients and contaminants, and changing fire regimes, among others. Uh, next slide. From its beginnings, uh, we designed Velma to model ecosystem service trade-offs. This figure illustrates how Velma and associated tools have been used to characterize ecosystem service trade-offs for contrasting forest management scenarios in the 80 square mile Michelle River watershed in Southern Puget Sound. This forest watershed includes lands managed by different owners for various objectives listed in the box at right. Forest products, local community forest sector income, salmon habitat quality, and ecosystem carbon stocks. The graph's y-axis compares the relative value of each of these four ecosystem service objectives across the three forest management scenarios shown on the x-axis. For example, estimated extraction of forest products from this watershed is highest for the current forest industrial practices scenario compared to estimates for the no forest harvest scenario and for the community forest scenario. The community forest uh, scenario it was co-developed with the Nisqually tribe and community forest. Uh, it, it involves application of ecological forestry practices to less than 15% of the watershed. Nonetheless, it is already generating more income for local communities in the Nisqually Basin uh, that is shown in the red bars. Uh, then that generated for communities under the business model of, of the distant owners of industrial forest companies. See, with projected future expansion of community forest lands, carbon sequestration in the purple bars can begin recovering toward pre-European old growth levels in the no harvest scenario. Uh, one click, please. Oh, that's already up. Never mind. Um, thanks. Uh, so. This research has already helped the Nisqually tribe and community forests achieve several positive outcomes listed in the blue box, uh, blue type in the lower right. And uh, there just isn't time to go through this, but it's, it's really impressive what they've done. Next slide. With colleagues from the University of Washington, Tacoma, NOAA Fisheries and others, our EPA team will be using Velma terrestrial ecosystem outputs as input for the Puget Sound marine ecosystem model shown at right. Velma will pass freshwater, nutrients, and toxic chemicals to the Salish Sea model, which in turn will circulate, transform, and pass those materials to Atlantis for modeling marine food web impacts. Also, Atlantis will pass adult salmon to Velma and associated terrestrial fish habitat models. Velma and co-models will return the favor by passing juvenile salmon to Atlantis. 
This three-year project is made possible by a grant from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation and by federal support from EPA and NOAA. Next slide. Velma model outputs are summarized on the left side of this slide. At the top left are the freshwater outputs that will be passed to the Salish Sea model. At lower left are Velma's juvenile salmon outputs to be passed to Atlantis. Shown at right are 18 major Puget Sound river basins and their outlets to Puget Sound, the little red dots showing those, uh, for which transfers from Velma to the Salish Sea model and Atlantis models will occur. A first round of Velma flow tests has been completed for these 18 river basins. More extensive Velma data setups and calibration are well underway for four watersheds outlined by red dashed rectangles at the, at the right. Next slide. Velma, uh, Velma model inputs for making those outputs possible include those shown at left, along with their sources. These include historical and future climate drivers, uh, all the way out to mid and late century, uh, stream hydrological data for model calibration, elevation data, historical and projected changes in land use and land cover, soil data, urban gray and green infrastructure data, and nutrient and contaminant uh, inputs. Um, a little more on that in a minute. And regarding spatial scale, Depending on questions of watershed cover types, the scale of Valma data grids can vary from five meters for urban and riparian areas and up to 90 meters for forest areas, all within the same watershed. In short, Valma is designed to simulate mixed use watersheds characteristic of the large Puget Sound, Puget Sound River basins shown at right. Next. Regarding nutrient inputs for Valma, the Department of Ecology figure at left summarizes due to some nitrogen sources and delivery pathways. I've added check marks to the companion Department of Ecology figure at right to highlight those nitrogen sources that Velma can model on the terrestrial side of things. Though this figure is about nitrogen, the same check marks are also applicable to contaminant modeling using Velma. There will not be time in this presentation to show nitrogen and contaminant modeling results to support this statement. However, the appendix of this presentation uh, provides some example Velma results from published and ongoing Velma research uh, regarding nutrients and contaminants. Next slide. This slide describes the kinds of nitrogen contaminant remediation decisions uh, and nitrogen and contaminant remediation decisions that Velma is designed to help inform. On the nitrogen side, on the left, these remediation decisions concern management of on-site sewage, agricultural sources, and natural sources of nitrogen, for example, from red alder. On the contaminant side, model remediation decisions concern management of urban stormwater, agricultural, atmospheric, and other human sources. Velma is designed to inform multi-scale remediation practices from placement of fine scale, uh, in other words, small plot green infrastructure uh, treatments uh, to reduce urban contaminant runoff and to identifying effective whole basin remediation strategies across terrestrial jurisdictional boundaries in the face of urban growth and climate change projections. Next. More broadly, our Puget Sound integrated modeling framework aims to provide process-based insights that illuminate cause and effects across scales that local and regional Puget Sound restoration managers and planners will require for developing integrated terrestrial marine ecosystem restoration plans. In this slide by Tessa Francis, we see how the coupling of Velma, the Salish Sea model, and the Atlantis model can potentially address, at least in part, the Puget Sound partnership, six overarching recovery goals and 25 vital signs. There is still much to prove here, but these models have been in use for some time now and their linkage has been designed with these capabilities in mind. Going forward in the belief that no single watershed model can answer all or even most terrestrial remediation questions, our Velma modeling team looks forward to interacting with and learning from the other watershed models and teams participating in this workshop. Next. In closing, 
This slide highlights some important modeling gaps that would be valuable to fill, uh, really essential to fill for Puget Sound Basin scale applications. This slide is a gap list for Velma, for which the first gap listed uh, downscaled climate change scenarios was recently filled thanks to Guillaume Maché and colleagues at the UW Climate Impacts Group. Uh, those gaps in the process of being filled or needing more work are listed in the second and third columns. I'll be happy to expand on these during our workshop discussion session uh, a little later. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that overview. Again, lots of content here. So feel free to drop questions into the chat. Um, as Bob mentioned, many of these presentations have some additional detail in the appendix, which um, you'll be able to reference after um, words when we post these. But in the interest of time, so we've got uh, an opportunity for discussion, I'm going to hand things over to Dan um, to talk about Sparrow. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, Dan Wise I'm from the US Geological Survey in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I'm going to stop my videos, just focus on the presentation. What I'm going to do is talk about um, sparrow modeling. And I'm going to um, basically talk about the um, model structure, the model inputs, and uncertainties with those inputs, the model outputs. Uh, but a focus uh, as far as the outputs um, on sparrow applications, nutrient applications uh, at, in, the, at the, in the Puget Sound. So let's go to slide two. The sparrow uses watershed attributes to explain the spatial variability in measured nutrient loads. So we're, basically what it is is a tool for interpreting water quality data over a large region or watershed or a region, hydrologic region. It's a process-based mass balance model that relies on a nonlinear least squares regression to minimize the difference between the predicted and measured loads. So it's a quite complicated uh, statistical analysis. But the key is that it's uh, two things. It's process-based, so it's mass balance. And it has a uh, basically a statistical engine in the background. And like I pointed out, it's, it's best suited for regional and large watershed assessments. Uh, for example, the uh, Puget Sound is a good candidate for that. Um, so slide number three. I just wanna uh, mention that we have been working in Sparrow, with Sparrow for quite a while, about 15 years. And recently we have developed models to represent um, <clears throat> 2012 conditions across five large hydrologic regions in the US, Northeast, Southeast, Midwest, Southwest, and Pacific. Pacific region includes um, the Puget Sound, of course. Um, and there were four parameters that were modeled, stream flow, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and suspended sediments. Okay, next slide. And I'm not gonna get into the model too much except just to show a diagram to, to point out that there's uh, three sets of data that go into the model. There's a hydrologic network. Uh, typically, uh, most recently, we've been using the um, NHD uh, version two. Uh, there are the calibration loads, which are um, estimated from measured stream flow and water quality at fixed water quality stations, and the watershed attributes, which are the uh, explanatory variables, such as nutrient sources, landscape properties, and in-stream processes that occur um, in the reaches. So they all go into the, Merrill, the Sparrow model calibration, and what comes out are a set of predictions and these are predictions for each reach that's modeled. So in the case of uh, the Pacific region, you know, they could have, I think there was something like uh, 130,000 reaches or something like that. Um, so what you get is the total load of the contaminant. In this case, we're talking about nutrients, so total phosphorus and total nitrogen, the local and watershed yield, the concentration, and um, also the contribution from individual sources to the total load. So let's go to uh, slide five. So there are hundreds of potential watershed attributes that are available to, to evaluate in the model as uh, explanatory variables. But we've learned from our experience that uh, there are really just a few that uh, play an important role when you're talking about nutrient uh, del delivering nutrients to streams. Um, and these are basically two groups. We have our point sources, 
that are non-point or diffuse sources. So point sources would be uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants, fish hatcheries, and um, a smaller number of industrial facilities. Now, um, on the non-point side, we have developed land, forest land, atmospheric nitrogen deposition estimates, uh, the number of people using septic tanks, farm fertilizer, livestock waste, and geologic phosphorus. And you also have some uh, landscape properties that affect, that affect how nutrients are delivered from land to water. And I list those over there. But what I want to point out here is, is um, in parentheses, are the uh, time intervals that are available to us to estimate these um, nutrient sources up to this point. Um, and you can see with the point sources, uh, we have some pretty good uh, temporal resolution, uh, especially uh, in Washington with the Department of Ecology. They have an excellent database of uh, wastewater discharge, both uh, um, discharge itself, so flow and um, concentrations often. Uh, but we also have fish hatchery data on an annual basis. Um, and an incomplete, somewhat incomplete database of industrial facilities, but we could fill the gaps in these um, data, data uh, points by using um, modeling on these point sources. Now, when you get to the non-point sources, the time intervals are much larger. So uh, for example, the NLCD that's developed land and forest land comes out every five years. Atmospheric deposition, well, that's monthly, that's pretty, uh, pretty refined. Um, but when you're talking about population using septic tanks, for example, it's really census base. Um, that's what we've been using so far. I mean, I think there could be some more refined estimates, uh, ways of estimating that, but so far we've had the de decadal um, census to work with. And if you're looking at farm fertilizer and livestock waste, you're, uh, so far we've been dependent on the, um, on the uh, agri USDA agricultural census. Now, um, the next slide, I'm gonna talk about um, our confidence in these source estimates. Because of the point sources, um, the resolution is pretty good temporarily, we have fairly high confidence in the uh, estimates we're making as far as um, monthly and annual uh, nutrient discharges. But when it comes to the non-point sources, that definitely decreases <laughs> quite substantially. Uh, we have higher confidence in the um, remote, remotely sensed um, data, like the developed land, forest land, NLCD business, um, and even the atmospheric deposition. But when we get to the farm fertilizer, livestock waste, um, not only are we dealing with uh, larger intervals, but we have to rely on some kind of geospatial modeling to estimate those um, inputs at the um, field level. And but fortunately, in the new sparrow modeling we're developing for the uh, Puget Sound, which is dynamic or seasonal modeling, we are really focusing on refining those estimates for uh, septic tanks, fertilizer, and livestock. And um, if we can do that and combine that with our confidence with the point sources, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. All right, the next slide. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here. Well, I got a few minutes. I just want to point out that we have um, some specific applications on the national level, one of which covers the Puget Sound. Um, and that's where we use Sparrow to inform local decisions or management uh, uh, related to nutrients. Uh, so I, I'm not going to go into this too much, but just to point out, there is an application in the, in the, in the Pacific region. So next slide. So I want to talk about how you can access results. So we have an online mapping tool called the Sparrow Mapper. And if you go to that tool, what you, you can do is uh, have a layer that shows the uh, locations of the impaired waterways that have been identified by the states in the Pacific region. So these are points. Um, and you can zoom in on, on a specific uh, either reach um, or an impaired water, waterway, uh, so, some area of interest. So let's go to the next slide. And when you do that, so I'm gonna take the Duwamish River uh, near its mouth. Um, so you can click on that symbol which is actually um, the actual location of the impaired waterway. And let's go to the next slide. And what you do, you get, you get the predictions from the model. So in this case, in the Duwamish River, the Sparrow estimates uh, about 56,000 kilograms per year of phosphorus. About one half of the phosphorus comes from natural sources. 
either upland geologic weathering or stream channels. But the largest anthropogenic contribution is from agricultural activities. That's a combination of fertilizer and livestock. And they're responsible for responsible for about 32% of the total phosphorus load in that reach. Again, you can get this from any reach in the region that you're interested in. So the next uh, slide. Oops, well, I didn't have a slide. So <laughs> I just want to conclude by thanking uh, the Institute for, for inviting me to this uh, workshop. It's really interesting. I really like the presentation so far. And I'm looking forward to our discussion later. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And um, for those who weren't able to join the Nutrient Forum last week, the Department of Ecology hosted that went into significantly more um, detail in terms of some of those upcoming refinements and inputs. I will drop a link to the presentation materials that have been posted there. And we'll also put a uh, the spare map or URL in the chat. In the meantime, Christian, handing it over to you. All right, thanks. That was a seamless transition. Um, I'm impressed with myself and you. Very well <laughs> uh, done. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. I'm um, Christian Nelson from Geosyntech Consultants. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on for a number of years uh, since 2016. It's uh, the Puget Sound stormwater heat map. Uh, this is focused uh, on the Puget Sound watershed and it's focused on uh, urban runoff <clears throat> and the pollutants that come off of urban land. Uh, it's really a, um, a stormwater tool, but I, I think that it has a lot of overlaps with what's already been uh, presented. Uh, it's really a regional effort that the Nature Conservancy uh, has been spearheading. Uh, all the products are available under an open source license, and um, they're the primary audience for this is uh, local stormwater managers, but we've had a lot of interest from uh, both state and federal agencies and, um, and uh, fisheries groups. So I'm happy to, um, to give an overview of uh, the developments today. Uh, stormwater heat map is a map. It's a, it's a spatial data tool uh, that has a number of uh, different uh, products that can be used for, for decision support or analysis. Uh, the three main categories of data that uh, are present in the stormwater heat map are, is uh, layers focused on water quality, layers focused on hydrology, and then we have some other landscape data uh, that might be of interest. Uh, today, I'm going to focus just on those first two, just on the water quality components and the hydrology components. Uh, for water quality, uh, right now, we have uh, five constituents that we've developed uh, spatial relationships for copper, zinc, total copper, total zinc, uh, total phosphorus, nitrate, nitrite, and total suspended solid. And then hydrology, we have some spatial data layers related to mean annual runoff, uh, flow duration index, which is a measure of the, the hydrologic change in an area, and also um, hydrologic response units that are used for modeling. And then we also have time series data as well that I'll, I'll talk about. So first, uh, this is kind of our visual abstract for our water quality regression methods. Uh, much like the, the SPARA model, we're looking at uh, spatial relationships that we can um, use to predict uh, water quality outcomes. We start with outfall monitoring data. This is actual monitoring data in the Puget Sound that stormwater agencies have collected. And, uh, and reported out. Uh, these also include self-reported uh, land use relationships. And um, we start looking at those, but then we also look at other predictors that might be useful. These include land cover, population, uh, uh, air pollution, traffic, um, other sorts of measures that we can either get from remote sense data or from uh, uh, spatially consistent uh, data layers. And then we do uh, regression modeling. Uh, we're using a, a Bayesian mixed effects model, which is um, similar to a, uh, a linear least squares model, uh, except we, we use a, a Bayesian method to, um, to start with our, uh, our, our prior distributions for our predictors. And then the mixed effects part is it allows us to adjust based on um, 
random effects and fixed effects. And the random effects in our case are the reporting agency. There's um, some differences in how the data is collected and how it's reported. So we treat that as a random effect. And then we, we treat the landscape data as a fixed effect. And then we also deal with spatial auto autocorrelation and then um, sensor data for non-detect data. And then once we've developed those relationships, then we, we test our hypotheses. Our null, hypoth our, our null hypothesis is that there's no relationship in, um, in these spatial predictors and water quality outcomes. Uh, we can reject that hypothesis if we show that there's a, a statistically significant um, relationship in either the land use uh, model or the landscape predictor model. And um, the, the normal way, kind of the, the, um, the default way of predicting uh, stormwater concentrations is to just look at land use. So look at uh, residential, industrial, commercial, and then make a prediction there. Uh, we wanted to show that maybe that there's some, uh, some underlying uh, things that are going on in those areas that might be better predictors. And for the most part, we found that our landscape data does a better uh, job at predicting than our land use model. So here's an example of what that looks like. This is for phosphorus. Uh, you see our null model here is just the median concentrations. Uh, each one of these boxes is a different outfall that's been monitored. Uh, each of these colors is a different reporting agency. So like uh, the red is King County, uh, the green is uh, Pierce County, I believe. Um, so we start with our null model. We look at the, the land use predictors. Uh, these are showing uh, the residuals in our regression model. And you want them to kind of line up uh, right around zero and not have uh, you know, too many above, too many below. So we see that our land use model does better than the null model, but then our landscape predictor model does even better than our land use model. And so the, the third model shown here, that's what we've used in our stormwater heat map. And then we take those relationships, we go back to those landscape predictors, and then that allows us to, uh, to generate this water quality layer. This is showing total zinc for Puget Sound. And because we have a uh, really high uh, resolution uh, landscape data, we can, we can show these, uh, these concentrations on a heat map level and really give local information to, um, to those local agencies that are, that are making decisions. Uh, so this is something that the, the Nature Conservancy really wanted to to visualize uh, because stormwater pollutants are not, you can't see them. And so this is a way to kind of show where, where the problems are, uh, are the worst. So that was, that's the water quality component. Next, I'm gonna talk briefly about the hydrology component. Uh, we also started with gridded precipitation data from uh, climate impacts group and at the University of Washington. We combine that with uh, the high resolution land cover data that we developed for the stormwater heat map. We ran a number of simulations using HSPF, which is uh, in contrast to the Velma model. It's not a gridded model, it's a lumped parameter model that's kind of a little more basic and it was developed in the 60s and 70s, uh, but it's what's used for stormwater management in Puget Sound today. So we wanted to, to generate results that were similar to what's being used for, for designing stormwater infrastructure. Uh, we generated, for each of the precipitation grids that uh, were available in the SIG precipitation data layer, uh, we generated uh, runoff responses using this model. Uh, we had 30 different response units, which are combinations of land cover, soil, and slope. And then we have three different runoff components in there. So we have surface runoff, inner flow, and groundwater flow. And we we did batch simulations of this model on the cloud. Uh, we have 50 billion rows of results, uh, which is a, a massive amount of results to deal with. Uh, so we've put those all on the cloud on a tool called BigQuery, 
which is uh, a Google uh, Cloud data product, which can be used for, for querying these results and assembling them for different areas. And so this is what it would look like. Um, this is how we generated these different results. We started with those soil parameters. We have those 30 different models, and then we've put them up on, uh, on BigQuery as a time series that's associated with each of these hydrologic response units. And then you can assemble these results for, for a particular watershed and get the results. And um, I am gonna skip the next slide and I'll just show what the, um, what the, the spatial aggregation of, of that data looks like. This is similar to the, uh, the pollutant data, but we have runoff data as well at a um, fairly high resolution. So you can pair this with your uh, predicted concentrations to get a mean annual load from these different areas. And then uh, you can also just query the data using uh, a watershed boundary. So if, if you have a particular watershed you're interested in, this is an example use case of what that would look like. You could uh, send your, uh, your watershed geometry and get the landscape data from the stormwater heat map. And then you can also send that, that, um, those components to the BigQuery data set and then query for hydrology results. And so that's what we did to generate this tool which shows how uh, runoff's predicted to change at different watersheds throughout Puget Sound. So these are all uh, accumulated results for these different watersheds and um, users can click on this and see a, a summary of how runoff is predicted to change uh, through in these different watersheds. So if you wanna find out more, you can go to stormwaterheatmap.org you can um, email stormwaterheatmap at gmail.com. There's uh, my contact inf information as well. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Christian. Hey, everyone. Jeff Berkey, uh, King County here. And uh, we've been developing what's called a water quality benefits evaluation, um, WICB. Everyone's got to have a good, good acronym, right? Um, so the primary purpose of this at the beginning was to support King County. Uh, updating their clean water plan. And uh, it's been evolving though. So we're starting with water quality, but we're going to move, we're, we'll be eventually moving into like flow control scenarios as well. Um, and um, I'll want to give the acknowledgements on the next slide here if you can. Yeah, so uh, I definitely want to give uh, credit where credit's due. First, uh, we have the project team. Carly is leading the whole effort. And uh, so those are alphabetical, but Carly is the PM for this. And I also wanted to just kind of touch on the, the experts. So we want to make sure everything we're doing makes sense. We're grounded. We have external reviews. And, and uh, I uh, noted Dino and Rich saying they're independent because when Dino's reviewing, he's not providing as an EPA. He's just an expert. Similar for Rich, he's not representing UW per se. He's just an, an expert. And then the consultants that we have on board, Herrera is the primary. And, uh, and Paradigm is one that's been doing all the modeling. Um, and then HGR was helping out in the cost. Lotus is providing QC of the, of the consultant work. RKI uh, and Osborne were also doing the um, designing of the BMPs, which is part of the sustained modeling that we're doing. And then Kearns of the West is the public engagement. So I just want to make sure that, um, that I always, always end up losing time on the acknowledgments. So next slide. So what is watershed model? You can cook, do a cookie, there you go. Um, so these are some of the official questions. You know, what is stormwater runoff entering the stream system? You know, is it entering uh, a catchment and a reach? Or what, what, is it, what are the loads going to a receiving water body? But really what we're talking about is developing a model to identify or characterize what are the impacts of stormwater runoff on the landscape? I mean, that's it in a nutshell. And just like everyone else here, um, you know, it's interesting everyone talks about regional models. And, and to me, I think we're doing a regional model because uh, it's more than just one river basin, but uh, it's, you know, our microcosm is King County focused. Uh, so next. So if people aren't familiar with LSPC, you've, uh, it, it's basically a derivative of HSPF, EPA basins thing. 
Um, it was originally developed by uh, Tetra Tech long ago and it was proprietary. Uh, and then over the years, they've made it uh, public. And then Paradigm um, has been taking it and, and improving it uh, over the last few years, fixing some bugs and then actually uh, um, giving some more functionality to it. So all we see is a uh, lumped parameter. Um, you know, Christian kind of said that HSPF is kind of a simple model. Oh, it is, but you know, I, keeping it simple is kind of a good thing too, I think. Um, but uh, so LSPC, uh, is, you know, you have catchments and landscape, and then you have the, the conveyances, reach and, and so forth. So the physical aspect of it is, you know, land cover, land use, elevation, slope, impervious surface. But you got to have knobs to calibrate. Um, so you do have uh, soil, soil uh, characteristics and so forth. So that's the, that's the quasi part of it. Um, and next. Yeah, so what are we simulating? So uh, what you can see in the map here are eight basins that are eight different LSPC models. And uh, you can see the pollutants that we're uh, calibrating there. So we're, the LSPC, uh, again, like HSPF, it's, it can simulate hourly for however much data, you, well, it can simulate any time period you want or any time step you want really, but hourly is kind of the, 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 a, a good, good uh, fit for what we're trying to do. And, uh, and we're doing it from 2000 to 2019 water years. So it's a 20 year period that we're simulating. And you can see here at the pollutants that we're modeling, um, we've calibrated at this point for the metals and for TSS. We plan on doing the nutrients next and, and, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. But so we're doing, 10, we're doing 10 water quality parameters at this point, a few of them are calibrated. And uh, for here again, you can see, um, uh, uh, the way we divvied up the models is, you know, the, the larger rivers, and we're below the reservoir, so we're not modeling any reservoir operations per se, other than what's observed in the gauge data. Um, so we're not doing upstream of the reservoirs. Next, please. Next. Ah. So uh, that's the eight basins, but also a catchment scale. So this is where you get into the spatial aspect of things. So. Each one of those is a catchment, and you can see it's very fine catchments where it's just a big black blob like by the SeaTac third runway area, uh, and then it gets very coarser. So for, for model output at this point, uh, every catchment you can get a time series, and, and it can be aggregated to annual or whatever, um, or kept at hourly. So for every catchment, there's the opportunity to output simulated results. And, um, the reason why you see this quite varied approach is we basically are trying to take ex past efforts of modeling that went into the highly detailed and incorporate them into the current model. So that's why it's quite variable and, uh, and uh, it'll be changing again over time. Next. So what are the other uh, inputs? So we had the catchments and now uh, just wanted to touch on the rainfall. Um, if people think about the HSPF, it is like a point source, but with the LSPC, it actually is grid. So um, that's one of the improvements of LSPC is it can actually, it's a gridded, it's a quasi-gridded model, if you will. Um, so we have the, you know, you use the NLDOS uh, with a combination of PRISM, and then you have to do a lot of correction because that data is a little bit problematic. And we have a lot of local rainfall data. So King County is very data rich in, in observations. Um, so we're definitely fortunate. So we have a lot of corrections to go on. And then um, because we're doing the upper watersheds as well of the Snoqualmie in the sky, I just, you know, doing snow melt for King County isn't normally a needed process because we're usually down in the more urban areas. So snow melt isn't that important, but for doing the whole county as we're gonna be doing it, snow melt is important for um, some of those. So I just kind of throw the calibration plot just to say that we got snow melt going on and that's the snowpack slide. So, um, and then there's all the other type of atmospheric things going solar and wind and so forth. Uh, next, and I won't belabor this, but uh, you've heard a lot of people talk about hydrologic response units. I'm just going to say HRUs. Um, that is the landscape. So it's the main things to take away from here is right. You have land use, land cover, geology, um, slope, uh, and uh, the main thing for this model effort is we're using the 2016 land use um, or land cover, if you will. And the land use is from the assessor, so it's kind of a, just an ongoing process of what's being developed. And then the impervious surface, right, that's another one of those things that's just kind of piecemealing and evolve and, and 
updating over time. So it's basically 2019, but we also included the city of Seattle's 2015 stuff. And then the other thing that's kind of a little bit of a, probably different than most things is uh, in the combined sewer area in the Seattle, Seattle, city of Seattle area, we have a combined sewer basin, right? And, and those basins have various amounts of connectivity. So the given catchment, it might be 10% actually going into the sewer system, 90% into the receiving water bodies or vice versa. It could be 90% going into the sewer system. So we have catchments that have partial connectedness identified. And then they're just touching on the, the snow melt calibration um, was pest calibrated. So that's kind of a nice stochastic tool there. Um, and then this map just showed that that map just, uh, that's kind of the, the list of all the HRUs and that's just a subset. And so there's 119, we ended up at 119 HRUs and, and uh, I won't go into that at this point. Next. And then you have the hydraulics, right? So um, for every catchment that I showed in that one map, there's a, there's a representative hydraulic and it could be a stream, it could be a wetland, it could be a lake, it could be a detention pond, whatever it might be. And that's, hydraulics is very important when you're gonna be talking about water quality on a local scale, because that, you know, all the stream energy and shear stresses and erosion and so forth, that, that's a big driver in a lot of stuff. So we pulled all the F tables from all the previous models been built for like the last 20 or 30 years, if you will. So, you know, without a doubt, there's going to be a lot of hydraulics that's old, but hey, it's better than just assuming a trapezoidal channel because you don't have any other information. So just want to show that uh, anything that's not green is hydraulics that are pulled from other models and anything that's green means we just use some kind of general hydraulics. But uh, um, so we have pretty, really well detailed hydraulics for the King County, for the Whitby Modeling Basin area. Next. And since uh, this is PSAMP and there, there is a focus on nutrients, I wanted to just call out how the, if you remember the 10, 10 parameters, the nutrients is the next thing to get calibrated right now. We're modeling it all and we're using just EMCs, the mean concentrations from past studies to, to simulate um, nutrients and the, and, the, and the organics and so forth. Uh, so it's pretty 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 uh, simple, not even build up wash off at this point for the nutrients. Um, but I also uh, wanted to just call out, you know, for agriculture. So in the agri the way the agriculture is developed in the model um, using a sensitive database, we found that uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't really characterizing the agricultural landscape. Um, well enough. So we're going to be revisiting and updating the egg when we get to the nutrient uh, calibration. Um, and then the other thing just to, to show is if, if anyone ever sees our results, um, uh, right now, like the, the, the nutrient loads, it kind of, it has decent correlations, um, but they're definitely underestimating volumes compared to observed. So um, uh, we have, we have decent, decent simulations, but overall mass balances are way low for the uncalibrated as it goes right now. And that, that just graphic just shows what the way the model is doing it is we have a concentration of EMCs and then just literally the runoff from the LSPC models and applying the concentrations to them and that's getting our loads. And that's done by HRU, by landscape. Next. Yeah, so uh, what, what uh, are some things that are gonna be happening, right? Well, so I talked about the calibration of the nutrients updating the, HR, the HRUs and the egg, but also it could be that we, you know, if we're doing nutrients, like we've seen some other people mention as well, you know, on-site septic would, could be a pretty big factor. Um, also age of development might be another big factor. So we'll be, when we update the HRUs, we might actually incorporate more different types of groupings, if you will. And, uh, and that's actually, that's the other thing nice about the LSPC is you can actually subdivide the HRUs uh, into different groups. So you don't have to rebuild an HRU if you add in something, if you can just split it out. So it's kind of a, it's a nice little feature to, to as a stopgap from having to rebuild a whole model is you can just subdivide the groups. Uh, and then I mentioned the, nutri the nitrogen and phosphorus modeling. The other thing that, that um, I wanted to highlight right now is I mentioned the eight different uh, LSPC models so they're all, they're connected and they're routing water flow through them all, all the way to the Puget Sound, um, or well, or with the sky and the Snoqualmie, it just stops at the boundaries there. Um, but for the, for the, for the pollutant loads, um, it is kept transferring through, but uh, we didn't, we haven't calibrated the fate and transport through these large water bodies like Lake Washington, Lake Union, Elliott Bay. 
So to account for the pollutant loads, we just used uh, um, uh, simple delivery ratios based on past uh, studies. You know, what is the loss of a pollutant between one, say, through Lake Washington into Lake Union? So there's studies that are out there that have done that. So we're just applying brute force, just annual delivery ratios to account for that kind of fate and transport between one LSPC model to the next. And so that's something that that uh, um, is, a, is a simplification by all means. And then the other thing that it is kind of important because this is, we're providing uh, stormwater modeling at a local scale. So some of the catchments um, may not be small enough and they may, they may be like, you know, many tens of square miles and they need to be smaller. So in some of those situations, we'll be refining the catchment delineations as well. And then I just wanted to touch that, you know, the LSPC is the watershed model but WICBI is a modeling tool set of things. And uh, so sustain, we'll go into it, um, but we also have some causal models as well. Uh, and um, so LSPC can provide the hydrologic and water quality inputs into kind of almost any kind of model there is, because it is a time series and you can, always, you can always roll up things and aggregate things much simpler than to disaggregate. So we're, you know, we're starting at the fine scale and you can always group things up together um, depending on what the needs are. Uh, next. And then um, what are some of the things that we're uh, talking about and, and likely going to do on some of it at least is, you know, population growth and land use change, right? So that I mentioned is based on 2016, but kind of the conventional typical things to look at things is what is like, uh, I won't say historical because some people, a forested, pristine landscape, a current landscape, and what's the future projections, right? Using comp plan, uh, uh, you know, what, are, what would be the pops, uh, possible uh, changes and impacts there? And then obviously climate change, that's a big one, right? And since the, um, the LSPC model is using a grid rainfall and certainly working with the climate impacts group and DM um, uh, on, on other projects for doing climate change uh, uh, projections on stormwater and a localized condition. So that'll be, uh, that, that data will be is almost readily available right now. Um, and uh, and then we got the CMIP six stuff coming down too, uh, and then also right. So I mentioned those ten water quality pollutants. The six PPDQ is obviously a big one, um, and there right we uh, we um, probably want to you know collaborate with the PSRC and get the AD you know transportation type densities and so forth and and uh, throw that into the mix. And then the IDI, right, is a pretty common indicator of stream health in this in the Puget Sound region. And there's flashiness that you can get since this is a time varying continuous hourly simulation. You can do stream flashiness and use some of those regressions that we that you that probably most people are familiar with, um, connecting the biology and the hydrology. Uh, and then we have the right the whole fish patches. So, so, so these are things that the model can use. So just be clear right now, we're, we know we're going to be doing nutrient calibration. And very likely climate change, um, and very likely six PPDQ, but um, still got to, you know, it takes time and money, and, and so we're still figuring out what kind of resources we're going to have available. Budget processes is just in the mix now. Thank uh, you, next. Jeff, and definitely helpful to hear what's on the horizon since as many of these tools and models have similar inputs, it's, there's opportunities for collaboration potentially, and so that'll certainly be something we dive into in the in the discussion, but I'm going to move us forward um, to Nick, and again, we'll have some appendix slides on each of these that will definitely be available offline, um, but wanna make sure we've got some time for discussion as well. Nick. All right, thank you. This has been very exciting. Um, so you may not be very familiar with the Freshwater Trust. If you're not, we're a nonprofit that works with partners to maximize the outcomes of water resource funding particularly to restore freshwater species habitat. And to that end, we've developed a modeling system called Basin Scout, which identifies whether there are benefits <clears throat> to integrating decentralized watershed actions into compliance, mitigation, or recovery strategies. And if there are, it helps to design and compare multi-benefit cost-optimized programs. Um, so we're currently working with King County to assess the potential for nitrogen controls 
uh, as agricultural BMPs um, to prevent nitrogen runoff into the system. But we're also thinking with King County more broadly about <clears throat> how to integrate many models like the ones discussed today to bring about the same type of decision making that Basin Scout enables and that you'll see in a few moments. Uh, next slide, please, Mario. <clears throat> um, so just briefly, based, oh, Basin Scout is typically focused on decentralized uh, actions, um, agricultural BMPs, as I said, or um, natural infrastructure. So this, it, but there's really a four part workflow that's automated and streamlined through Basin Scout. And the first part of that workflow is to characterize all potential project sites within an area of interest. And then potential projects are evaluated as feasible or infeasible at each project site. And then cost benefit modeling is used to evaluate the costs and impacts of implementing projects at specific sites. And then you essentially have a database of all the, all the impacts across many metrics um, and cost of projects. And with that, you can build cost optimized programs or determine feasibility of using these types of actions in the watershed. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is an example of a dashboard that we'd provide to users um, and partners we're applying Basin Scout with. Currently, it's not a tool that's directly usable by external users, but we are developing user interfaces um, and online decision support tools to that end. Next slide, please, Mario. So the types of decentralized or nature-based actions or BMPs that can be evaluated with Basin Scout are listed here on the left. Um, <clears throat> today, I'll really just be focusing in my examples on agricultural fields as potential project sites, but we have developed systems to look at potential projects throughout agricultural water and drainage networks, including piping of the delivery networks and practices like installing wetlands within the drains. Those do involve more hydraulic simulation than what I'll discuss today. And but typically we would rely on other models for larger kind of hydrologic systems assessment, but in these cases, um, these man-made networks aren't handled well within many existing watershed models. Um, so we use Basin Scout to look at, or to help our partners essentially look at uh, a suite of water quality objectives or, or water resource objectives, including water quality, typically focused on nutrient and sediment inputs um, or temperature loading. Uh, water quantity uh, objectives such as in-stream flows or groundwater recharge, as well as habitat restoration when, when that is potentially part of a program. Um, we then rely, as I said, on larger or I guess broader water scale, scale, watershed scale models locally calibrated to determine how a loading or change in a site-specific metric that we're looking at is translated to an in-stream concentration um, or other <clears throat> metric more relevant for compliance or for species. Um, next slide, please, Marielle. And real briefly, before we get into some of the technical aspects, I just want to say over the last 10 years, Basin Scout has been used in three primary contexts. The first is Clean Water Act compliance um, in Oregon and Idaho. The second is to optimize the outcomes of public investment in water infrastructure funding. Um, and lastly, we've been using it lately to build multi-benefit strategies for um, situations of water scarcity in agricultural settings. But today I'm gonna really focus on an example where a stakeholder is using or is interested in assessing the degree to which agricultural BMPs can help control nitrogen. So next slide, please, Mario. So these are an example of our, or some of our default inputs. You can see how they overlap with many of the model inputs discussed today. Um, as I said, in this example, we would be looking at every agricultural field individually within um, the system we're assessing. 
So those agricultural field polygons are not a data source that's typically provided through federal agencies like these other ones are, but so we may have to manually digitize those, but we're working towards <clears throat> AI generation of our field polygons. And in many states, they already exist. But once we have the field polygons, uh, what Basin Scout does is streamlines and automates a process of aggregating um, and standardizing many, many different data sets to store as, as attributes of the fields in our geospatial database. So this includes the crops, which we get uh, from USDA. Uh, similarly, the, so the soil profile is from USDA, the slope or topography from USGS, and we use a machine learning model for irrigation type prediction. I will say that these are just our default inputs. Um, Basin Scout is very flexible. We can essentially replace any of these with a geospatial data set, that's a raster or vector form. Um, and in almost every case, one of these is replaced with uh, more regional, regionally relevant data. <clears throat> we also are using additional hydrologic models like many of yours along with Basin Scout in many cases. So we will try to um, make sure our inputs align with those models as best as possible. And there's also additional inputs almost in every case. An example of that would be whether a field is within a flood zone or its distance to a stream, if that's relevant for the particular application. Um, next slide, please. Um, after each site is characterized, we look at what potential projects are, are feasible or suitable for that individual site. Again, in this case, the site is um, each agricultural field in the watershed. Um, for nitrogen controls, in our CS practices, we would typically assess what include irrigation upgrades, riparian fencing, fencing for cattle management, um, filter strips, manure management on dairies, or in-drain return wetlands. And so our feasibility and suitability analysis is an automated routine, which essentially asks, is the BMP already implemented based on the data we have? Um, do appropriate management and physical conditions exist? And are there locally specific constraints? So we work with the local stakeholders and partners to configure our feasibility criteria in each location and integrate um, their particular expertise and knowledge into our code base. Um, next slide, please, Mario. Then for each, at each site and for each potential project at each site, we then conduct the site, the cost benefit analysis or, or cost impact analysis. <clears throat> the, for the cost, we build costing models for each particular practice and those take into account fixed and variable costs, um, as well as implementation capital costs um, and maintenance over time. Uh, those are configured for each geography we apply Basin Scout based on local NRCS cost share data and enterprise budgets. Um, but for the water resource output, and in this example, uh, for nitrogen runoff from fields or the change in, in annual nitrogen runoff from fields, we're relying on existing models. Um, in this case, USDA's APEX model, and we're particularly using a version or implementation of it called the nutrient tracking tool. And we've worked with the developers of this tool to uh, develop an, an API and, and increase their uh, processing abilities so that we're able to now run batch simulations of practices um, simulated on each field, which typically is in the hundreds of thousands of scenarios <clears throat> for any Basin Scout run. Um, we also configure our apex modeling to each location. So that's typically gathering data about local agricultural management in terms of fertilizer applications, tillage rates, stocking and seeding rates, and those types of things. And the nutrient tracking tool uses PRISM data, um, and it's looking at the past 30 years of meteorological data, but this is something we're working to be able to make more flexible with 
the developers hopefully in the, in the future. Next, next slide, please. And then finally, the, the program design aspect. So the real novel inputs to um, Basin Scout are the, the program design targets and constraints. So a target that is typically as uh, presented as a cumulative loading reduction that is needs to be achieved to hit a certain in-stream concentration reduction. Um, and constraints are things like the areas a partner is interested in implementing projects within, the types of projects they're interested in implementing, and you know potential program budgets and things like that. The outputs then are what are the potential impacts given a certain amount of spending <clears throat> or um, or if or the program level costs if they're trying to meet a certain target, excuse me. Um, so overall, we show each site, we show the, how they're ranked in terms of cost efficiency or overall impact. Um, they're also, because not one metric is, is modeled, it's many, so we can look at co-benefits and trade-offs among various strategies. We use sensitivity analyses for risks uh, to look at risks in terms of how a program costs may change with um, things like recruitment success. Um, and then next slide, please, Marielle, because I know I'm out of time and this is kind of the crux. So as I said, we're always using a companion locally calibrated model. And in, the, in a quick example with SWAT, uh, which is a commonly used hydrologic model for us, um, SWAT would be needed to set the target in terms of a load reduction, or if it was after the program design phase, it may be to say and a certain amount of money can reduce loading within an area by X amount. And then that, that is assessed as an in-stream or a change in in-stream concentration of nitrogen through a model like SWAT. Uh, we've also worked within SWAT to replace BHRUs with our Basin Scout fields. That would be more of a dynamic version of uh, an integration of these two models. And we've also are working towards uh, running all potential programs through SWAT um, to develop a response service surface through Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so these are just all examples of how we use additional models outside of Basin Scout um, in different ways. And the Basin Scout has site level models integrated in it for program design. And that's it. Thank you, Nick. So we are going to take a just quick five minute break um, so that everybody can recycle that coffee and tea from this morning. So we will meet back here at 1025 and see you all soon. In the meantime, feel free to drop questions into the chat and, and noodle on what you'd like to know more about any of these tools or thinking about kind of shared collaborative inputs. Um, to, to take us through some thoughts on future <clears throat> and scenarios across these watershed models and tools. Thank you, Mariel. Um, my name is Stefano Matsuli, and I'm also from Puget Sound Institute and have the pleasure of meeting most of you on this call. We've got a good turnout. Um, it's been great to see the presentation so far. Um, for this second part, we're going to do two parts, really, for the remainder of the workshop. And the first is I'll give a brief sharing of a summaries on some of the um, efforts in the region that provide some of the key inputs shared across most um, of the model and decision support tools when they're addressing longer term future scenarios of change in watersheds. So population drivers, land cover, change in climate change, for example. Uh, this is complementary, um, but has some overlap on some of the presentations earlier and, and the efforts that have been presented. Um, and most of the leads for this work are on the call here and can answer further questions and provide detail and follow up. And the second part here is um, we'd really like to open the floor for questions to the various presenters for a panel discussion and response around this topic. And we've put up two, two key questions here as thought starters to spark discussion. So the first is what are the key inputs? or knowledge gaps that would be valuable to refine for models and tools in the region. And the second is uh, then what are the shared inputs that could potentially benefit 
um, from these collaborative improvements. So really, what are the commonalities um, that could be collaboratively developed together across efforts? Um, so please put your questions to presenters around these topics in the chat. Um, raise your hand at the end if you can, and we will get back to you directly. And I'll ask that um, our presenters also uh, put on their video when we get to the discussion time. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so starting off with the land cover change module, uh, model, excuse me, that's um, being an effort led uh, largely by Kevin Bogue at Puget Sound Institute. And this, uh, as with other uh, modeling efforts, uses the land cover, um, the national land cover database um, as inputs, and it projects parcel level land cover change into the future. Um, this focuses specifically on six uh, land cover classes of that database, and those are really the ones around habitat change and habitat provisioning specifically. Drivers include uh, urban growth, uh, manufacturing and, and transport and infrastructure, and it's a, a state and transition uh, model, which gives a, an annual output. Next slide, please. Um, again, uh, in vision, has been shown earlier uh, from um, faulty work. And this is um, an effort that's been highly tied with the Puget Sound uh, Future Scenarios project. Uh, it's spatially explicit and includes a multi-agent approach to change modeling. Um, and most importantly, in terms of outputs, it's very much um, covering the gamut of what we've been looking at here. So population growth, hydrology, uh, land cover change, climate impacts, and uh, particularly um, habitat provisioning. And the period that's been uh, looked at is 2020 to 2080. Next slide, please. The Future Scenarios Project of um, Puget Sound Partnership is included here. Um, and this is more of a, a systematic framework um, that is applied to Puget Sound recovery goals and vital signs, rather than a specific um, model or decision support tool input. So it looks at explanatory scenarios of, and uncertainties around climate change, population growth, um, et cetera. And, and then also has and is continuing to work with a number of different modeling efforts, um, in particular Envision and some of the qualitative network models and, and uh, the work of uh, Caitlin Mogul more recently from PSI, who's on this call. Um, on the right here, we have an illustrated visual of the framework uh, with a number of drivers and metric, which include some of these human dimensions, and I understand that um, since this, uh, there's been now a down selection to a few specific targets as well. Next slide, please. So given the importance of climate change inputs across all efforts um, for modeling future scenarios and watersheds, we've included a slide here highlighting the, the climate impact group that many of you have been working with and some of the initial considerations that uh, Guillaume has provided to us here on how to address downscaling and application of regional climate change models as inputs to future scenarios. So this obviously is a workshop on its own or a number of those, but the key takeaway here is that we should consider and use a range of projections and processes um, of downscaling, whether it's dynamic or statistical, should also include a, um, a bottom-up assessment of the sensitivity for that specific application or model really that there's not a one size fits all with one particular projection. Um, Guillaume also kindly highlighted the Snover et al. Uh, 2013 paper listed there and will be in the links. Um, and this is a good synthesis and guide uh, when taking into some of these considerations for, um, for downscaling. Uh, we've also listed a number of the hydrodynamic uh, models that are relevant to China, climate change input um, there are many, many more that are specific for, for particular purposes, such as flood risk, and we'll put some information at least on the leads for these and expect that in follow-up peace and meetings, uh, we can have a deep dive on, on some of these particular applications. Next slide, please. And so for the discussion, um, I'd like, now like to open the floor for folks. So if you could please uh, raise your hand and those 
those that have presented, if you could uh, turn on your video. Um, we look forward to your questions on these specific topics and we'll also save some time um, at the end if we can for Q&A or, or put things in the chat so we can do follow up on, on any specific uh, um, model related questions you might have as well. And if I can clear my screen a little bit so I can see the questions. Let's have a look what we have. And while I'm reading that, maybe I'll just start with, um, uh, if I could start with one um, while I'm looking through those that I had for, I think it was uh, Dan, Dan Wise, um, and looking at some of the, the forestry inputs, which I thought was relevant across all of the presentations you folks had had. Um, it looks like there's a delineation of uh, forestry inputs, um, but since we're focusing on nutrient loading, uh, in our earlier workshops, we'd had a discussion on the role of alders and, and forestry succession. And so, Dan, I thought perhaps if you could speak first to uh, how much confidence we have in, in this forestry delineation, particularly relating to, you know, um, Alders and, and the role of, in um, nutrients. Uh, yeah, then, I would go ahead. Yeah, and then pass it on. So go ahead. Yeah, um, I would say if um, if our inputs, I'm um, have pretty high confidence in that because of the uh, approach that's used to estimate it. Uh, we get it straight from the uh, the Lima Group at OSU, and it's a um, it's a it's a thirty meter raster, thirty meter, I think. And it's an estimate of uh, basal area of the alder trees in each cell, or density, it's a density, sorry. Um, so the basal density. And, um, and that, that source is a pretty strong predictor of in-stream nitrogen load, uh, where, that, where the, that, that uh, type of, spe that species occurs. So, um, and I think if I'm, Remember, I think it's done annually. They, they're, they update it each year, which is, uh, you know, more refined than what we get for the other source inputs, like I said. So for a diffuse source, uh, it ranks pretty high as far as our certainty in that. Thanks. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does. I think it starts a good point for a discussion from other folks as to how that data is used in, in your model. Bob, if you could comment on that or, or also Jeff, and, and consideration of the fact that we're also looking at future scenarios. So how do we know how much that older, you know, the, the, the difference in nitrogen fixation versus loss might be in forestry in the future? Yeah, um, I, I agree with uh, you, Dan. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great data set that you described. Uh, we've used it. Uh, to model uh, basically nitrate concentrations in streams in the coast range of Oregon. And it, it was uh, uh, really, uh, Belma did a, a very good job on that uh, over uh, a year period. And uh, without those data, it would have you know, just been a shot in the dark. So it, it's very high quality data. And um, uh, we have a, a figure in the, slide deck that I presented earlier that describes that work and, and I'd be happy to talk about that. I think uh, the other part of your question, Stefano, about uh, going into the future, um, that's a tougher question to extrapolate for. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, there are things that can be done to remediate some of that. And by the way, I would say that it's not necessarily a bad thing of uh, mm. the, the input of nitrogen uh, into streams by alder. And in many cases, it improves the productivity of stream invertebrates uh, that are important for salmon. So um, we have to be careful how we think about that as a, a problem. On the one hand, feeding nitrogen into the estuary um, is a problem, but you know, compared to other nitrogen inputs, it's probably not in most places uh, as big of a problem as 
um, really dwarfed by, by some of the other inputs that we've been talking about uh, today. That's great, Bob, thanks. Does anybody else have any reflections from the way that they're dealing with forestry and that particular uh, issue of succession? Um, so another question that's come up earlier or, or just looking, you know. Jeff, and I'm going to pause you there because I think you've yeah. got uh, someone looking to reflect on that because I see Gordon's hand. So Gordon, ah, thank you. Now. thanks, Gordon. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I just thought that was a really good point that that Bob made about um, productivity in the streams. And I just wanted to point out that overall nutrient concentrations in Puget Sound streams are pretty darn low. They're um, for the most part below half a milligram per liter and you know, rarely except for in a couple of cases above a milligram per liter. Um, so, you know, nutrients play two sides of the coin and, and our streams are actually in pretty good shape for the most part. Thanks, Gordon. Um, we have a question from Alan Chapman. Do you want to unmute yourself? And if that's not, if you, I can uh, I can just read it out then. Um, so Alan was asking. This is to to all of you all. If you can um, go through the. Will the existing model projections and um, around stream flow change associated and the changes associated with climate change be mediated effectively by natural infrastructure improvements? Uh, this is Bob. I, I'd like to just speak briefly to that. Um, it's it's well established now that uh, young forests. Um, managed on short rotations, in other words, uh, consume, uh, transpire much much more water than older forests. Uh, up to two to three times more water gets transpired in say a 40 year old forest compared to a 80 or 100 year old forest. And that has the effect of reducing summer wool flows, um, especially in August, um, September, early October uh, when spawners are, are trying to get upstream. And so we've been working with um, tribes uh, in the Puget Sound region to look at using uh, alternative uh, forest practices. When I say alternative, I mean uh, alternative to um, the industrial forest uh, approach uh, with short rotations. And so the community, uh, Nisqually Community Forest is actually using um, ecological forestry practices, long rotation, 80 uh, years or so, uh, which is at the point where forests uh, are using about half as much water as young forests. And so that's been put into motion. Uh, other, other tribes are, um, and the Nisqually tribe and, and Nisqually community forests are, are taking that up. And, um, we think that uh, over time, there are other things that can be done too to help mitigate uh, low flows at least. So I'll, I'll stop there. And there's a, thank you, Bob. And there's a question from uh, Lynn Schneider, if you're able to unmute, otherwise I can, I can uh, ask that. Okay, I'll, I'll ask it and then if you can get yourself unmuted for any follow-up, that would be great. So uh, Lynn Snyder's put forward, I'm wondering how the massive die-off of dug fir trees over the past few years is being incorporated or updated um, in these models. Jack. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting because, right, for us, uh, at least in King County, like right, the dominant stormwater impacts is developed landscape and not the forested landscape and the nutrient and inputs, you know, from uses of that. But uh, to, uh, right now, the way we're representing the trees um, and their processes 
it's static and it's one grouping kind of thing. We're not differentiating between coniferous or deciduous even really. It's um, based on, you know, calibrating whatever kind of catchments we have that are as homogeneous as possible of a forestal landscape and then applying that region wide. But we're never, we're, at this point, um, we're not differentiating the different types of trees in their processes. Doesn't mean we can't, um, but that's just not been the focus because that's a, a secondary input to the stuff coming out of King County. Yeah, and the, for Sparrow, it all relies on what's provided by the NLCD or any possible updates in between. But it has to do with you know um, actual uh, coverage, land cover. So if 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 in five or ten years that those those um, that profile changes, or maybe it gets converted to open space or something, then that would be reflected in the models. But that um, that contribution from non alder forests is is pretty small generally, you know, because it, it's it's kind of swamped by uh, atmospheric. It, as a background source, it's swamped by atmospheric deposition and then the alder trees. You know, if you look at the predictions. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Um, and uh, Lynn says thanks as well there. And I think Gordon, did you just raise your hand again on that? Or is that still left there? Yeah, I do have something to say about a, a non-forced uh, knowledge gap yeah. before we move on to the question two. Yeah, let's do that. And then and Gordon, if it was, just put in the chat and I'll We'll come back to it. Yeah, and it, it has to do with um, predictions for water, uh, for areas that have very low nutrient yields, mm -hmm. um, specifically uh, phosphorus. Because as I pointed out in our, my slides, that we're we're using to, to 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 estimate the contribution from different sources out there in those areas, we're we're using some kind of geospatial modeling based on data that is kind of coarse to start with. So, you know, we have an estimate of geologic phosphorus. And, and out in those areas, uh, it's really two players for phosphorus. It's geology and possibly um, uh, grazing cattle. And if you saw the slides that Christiana presented at the Nutrient Forum, she pointed out an area where um, it really, the, the model really missed the mark on the west slope of the uh, Olympics there. Um, and that really had to do with the fact that it's a, it's a, they're, they're low phosphorus yields and the model's struggling with what it has, which is um, some estimate of background phosphorus and some estimate of raising cattle that probably were attributed to an area that they shouldn't have been. Um, and that's what we struggle with is when we create the input, you know, we have to delineate areas uh, where cattle can be if they're grazing. And then, if we miss that, then that gets propagated through the modeling. Um, so in the next round of modeling for the Puget, we're really focusing on refining those ag inputs. So we really get a good handle on that and use as much information as we have, local information, to really um, nail down those estimates of the agricultural sources. Thanks, Dan. And I'll pass to Gordon, and this will probably be on the, the same topic. I, I, no, no, um, it actually isn't. It's a question for the folks that are modeling atmospheric deposition and um, just a question of, of magnitude in the models. And the reason I asked this question is we actually measured it using um, o, the O17 isotope of oxygen, which is uh, a known dead marker for atmospherically derived nitrate. And we hardly can see it. In the waters, we only see it in in rivers that are dominated by snow melt and at certain times of year. And so, our interpretation is it's only a really meaningful fraction of the total when you involve systems with high snow, because nitrate's known to be kind of scrubbed out of the atmosphere by snow, and we never see it in any other system. So, I'm wondering if that kind of matches what your models say or conflicts. 
So you're mm -hmm. saying, say, in a higher order stream down in the watershed, you don't see that signal? Yeah, you know, so we see it. Yeah. yeah, we never see it downstream, really. And, you know, we see it out of the upper uh, Nooksack, upper Skagit, mm -hmm. um, the, the stuff coming off the Olympics. We can see it there. And it's usually timed with the, the spring freshet, right? So which is why we're tying it to the snow. And otherwise, it's basically undetectable using our method. And, and the method's thought to be pretty sensitive. Oh, yeah. Um, I could say with the sparrow results, you do see similar a similar pattern that mm. there's a signal from atmospheric deposition lower in the watershed, but it really just gets uh, swamped out by point sources, ag, and urban runoff when you're getting down to the mouths of those rivers. Yeah, I should note we're we're using the same stations as the ecology monitoring stations. Yeah. So, all right. Well, interesting. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon, and thanks, Dan. Um, so we had a, a, a point here from uh, Ken Pierce that would be good to reflect on, and that is that the, um, the land trend DR uh, mapping of Seattle was showing to lose impervious surface as a, at a regional level. Um, and over the, I think it's the post-2005 period. Um, any reflections on that from the group? Stefano, did I, did I hear right that you said that impervious surfaces are, are uh, decreasing? In, mm -hmm. in, uh, based, urban... based on that particular mapping, and then also pointing out, Kim pointed out that they're all fairly terrible at mapping those land cover changes, but just putting it out there to the group for, for comment on impervious surfaces. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I, I was not aware of, of that, um, those data. But uh, that's good news if that's true. That's the direction we want to go for sure. And Ken, you are now able to unmute if you want to uh, expand on that reflection and question. Great. Oh, still on mute, Ken. That's good. Let's see if we can unmute you. Ah, there we go. Uh, yeah, it wasn't letting me unmute. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're impervious surface is not going down in Seattle. There's there's no way. Um, we, we have a massive amount of data to show that it's not. Um, it's just completely erroneous. And we've looked at LC map, we've looked at land trender, we've looked at uh, CCAP over and over and over again. They're just terrible at mapping urban, uh, urban land cover change. And they even, much to my surprise, did, did produce a paper that compared them a few years ago in Forest, I think, and it said that on average, all of these models miss 80% of the change that occurs, and about 80% of what they do map is actually erroneous. Well, that's something to consider for everybody in the group, so. <laughs> Throw it out there. I yeah, can put yeah, the link for that yeah. paper in the, uh, Thank you. the chat as soon as I find it again. Jeff, would you like to have a first stab at that? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, um, I think for everyone, there's multiple data sources being used to develop their HRU or landscape. And there's there's error amongst, you know, like the geology, right? That's highly variable. And the geology is a big driver of runoff, right? You know, so, um, and like Ken was saying, you know, the impervious surface is a high resolution and fairly accurate, although, um, you know, our logging roads. I mean, some there's definitely some errors associated to the impervious surface as well. But um, from what I've seen, that seems to be the most accurate. It may be, you know, the gray areas of where it's highly disturbed land cover, but it may or may not be actually impervious, but highly impacted or something like that. But I guess I just keep people to think about there's many things that go into the hydrologic landscape, not just land cover that have their own commission omission issues. If I can just... Thanks, Jeff. And before you do, uh, Christian, I'll just give a comment from uh, Aaron Clark earlier for this discussion, which is, the, is the Seattle data predicting effective impervious surface um, area instead? So incorporating the green infrastructure that's offsetting impervious, especially with redevelopment. Uh, it, it's just mapping that urban tree canopy is getting 
more mature in areas. And so you're seeing uh, faults conversion from low density urban to forest based on the tree canopy expanding over time. Uh, it's a completely spurious signal. Right. Christian? Just anecdotally based on our evaluation of, of some of those data sets, uh, we found that uh, a lot of the data sets like the um, NLCD data set that's developed for the entire country uh, has more error in our region um, just because those models need to calibrate and predict across a, a large area. And they miss a lot of the nuances with Puget Sound, like uh, our, our tree canopy is a lot thicker. Um, we just have, you know, we're, we're a lot different than Texas or Arizona or Florida. And um, I think that's probably the source of a lot of the errors that, you know, these models have to be applicable everywhere. Um, that's why we, we tweak things for the um, stormwater heat map to be more um, indicative of, of the land cover we have here. I, I just got add, uh, Christian just totally uh, um, pumped me is when I was talking about the different layers, right? There's um, different levels of accuracy, like road layers are gonna, you know, any linear features are gonna be hard to represent as a raster as opposed to something else. And then like wetland layer, you know, things that are, highly detailed and even surveyed, you know, there's this whole su super imposition of, of various levels of accuracy to then build up your thing. So again, it's land, it's not one thing that's really going to be your final product. It's a, it's a compendium of a whole bunch of landscape features. Yeah, things would be a lot easier if there were no trees around roads. So if there, you know, if we could just get rid of all the overhanging trees so we could predict the roads a lot better, that'd be make things a lot easier for us. Yeah, that's your okay. comment in general. You know, if we could just get rid of the trees, things would be a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, well, there was a question we, about livestock uh, before this discussion that we didn't. Uh, we did not, Dan. I, I think I'll come back to that because okay. I just wanted to get onto the monitoring so that we're, we're okay. uh, yeah, there were a couple of questions on monitoring and then maybe we can come back to that if we have time. Um, so the first one was from um, Chu Hu Dong, which was, I was wondering how much monitoring data avail is available for calibration and, and to verify the proposed models. And if we need to put some more resources um, into site-specific data collection for model development, so that's a fairly general question to the group. And then uh, this is followed by Lynn uh, Schneider's again, um, that, that she's specifically curious if we need more data to demonstrate the contributions from on-site sewage systems, and especially as these systems um, transition from train uh, to drain field, the complex on-site treatment. Um, the on-site, the complex treatment uh, systems have a much greater nutrient reduction capacity and capability. Um, who would like to start with that general or more specific? Relating to sewage systems. Uh, Jeff. Bob, Bob beat me if he wants to go first. Oh, did he? I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 go right ahead. Oh, Bob, you're on mute. Yeah, there Jeff should have gone first. Um, anyway, uh, I, I would uh, cast a vote for. Uh, urban contaminants and just trying to get a handle more on the deposition, the uh, residues, uh, pools that are, are legacy pools, especially for things like six um, uh, PB, PCBs, um, PBDEs, things that are ending up in the food web uh, all the way up to orca and salmon. Um, there's just so much history that that went into those legacy uh, chemicals uh, that trying to find a, a good uh, widely distributed mapping of that is quite a quite a task. Um, I think there are, there is some info on that, but um, finding it in a readily accessible place is a, a problem as well. 
And Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, again, um, King County is pretty data rich. Um, so, you know, if you think about the whole model development and the, and the calibration, you know, the thing I'd say we could always do better on is to have more replication of as homogeneous of type of landscapes as possible and the water quality loadings and concentrations associated with that. We can always do better because we're, that's always very limited. And if you have, the, if you take the whole Puget Sound, yeah, but you have different, different possible hydrology and soil. So you can't really extrapolate too far beyond your areas if you're trying to keep it localized to your specific. And then the, the other thing I'd say is, you know, if you also have to keep in mind the, the processes like large lakes, right? You can monitor what's going in, but what's going out is going to be something different because there's, there's all sorts of nutrient cycles going on. And, and, and um, so just doing the streams is one thing, but if you have a lake between you and something else, that's, you know, that's another thing you always have to keep in mind. And, and, and that's right. Lake dynamics is, is, is a whole nother model, right? So we're simplifying things um, from the get go on that. Thank you, Jeff. And we're, we are at time just as the discussion is getting a little bit more engaged on this. And I think we really just need to have the opportunity for some of this follow up for particularly on watersheds. Um, we did have a comment from Curtis, which has been responded around vegetation and um, we'll follow up with everything in the chat. And I will hand over to either Tessa or who's gonna close now here. I'm just gonna hand it over, thank you. Or is it I'm, Jana? I'm there we go, thank you yeah. very much. Um, so, hey everyone, just a quick wrap up. I um, put some notes in the chat and just wanted to say thank you to everyone who presented today and Stefano, Marielle, and Tessa for organizing. Um, and if you're interested in the modeling work group, you can email me to get you on the list. We're planning uh, our next meeting for February. Um, additionally, I just put another plug in for the modeling compendium form. Um, and then finally, a link for updates and recordings from the workshop today. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you.